Okay, so listen closely. This, I'm going to do this in parts. Uh, we'll learn by doing, but put everything else away or I will lift it up. I want your undivided attention, even though we're going to be dividing something. So we're going to be learning now. Now we know uh, in our senses that we've been learning, uh, diagramming, and we've been studying the parts of sentences. Um, we can have uh, two subjects, and when we have two subjects, what kind of a subject do we have? What do we call that, Jonathan? Compound subject. Compound subject. Then if we have two direct objects, what kind of a direct object is that? Compound direct object. And if we have two verbs, what kind of verb is that, William? Good. I'm glad that you're following along here. And then what if we have two predicates, Joyce? Compound predicate. No surprise there. Those weren't trick questions. But still, even though we have a compound subject or any one of those elements, those are compound elements, you understand? Right. They're compound elements in a sentence, but <clears throat> actually there's one other group of words we can talk about uh, that actually is more fundamental than a sentence, more fundamental, which is the, I was hoping for a juicy pen. This looks juicy. Yeah. Well, we can have a group of words with a subject and a verb. We've been working with them all the time. Every sentence that we have diagrammed is a group of words which contains both a subject and a verb. Do you agree? Right. But actually, the name for this group of words which contains both a subject and a verb is not necessarily a sentence. So uh, I can say, William did not put a diagram on the board before class. Period. Are you happy? Is that a complete thought? Yeah, William did put not, did not put a diagram on the board before class. Okay, happy. But, and so that's a complete thought. And I'm not going to take anything away from that sentence, but I'm going to actually add something to it and see what you think. Because William didn't put a diagram on the board, period. Are you happy, Shirley? No, you're waiting for more information, right? Right, so I have a group of words with a subject and verb, but it can't stand alone as a sentence. It's not a complete thought, right? So just having a subject and verb is not sufficient to have a sentence. So there's a name for this egg, a subject and a verb. This is called a clause. But is it spelled this way? No, it's spelled, surely, as C, clause. So this is a clause. A clause is a group of words which contains both a subject and a verb. Only a verb, not a clause. Only a subject, well that doesn't even make sense. <laughs> so, you know, uh, so, but you can travel the world, sail the seven seas, climb the highest mountain, you'll never find a clause. What? True. You know why, Chris? What? Well, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think that's why. I'm not sure I understand. But the reason is that by the time you find a clause, it already will have split. It'll either be an independent clause which can stand alone as a sentence. William did not put a diagram on the board before class, period. Or it will be a dependent clause which is which cannot stand alone as a sentence because William didn't put a diagram on the board, period. Not enough. So that's the truth that clauses, a clause is just an idea. It doesn't really exist in reality because already it will either be an independent clause or a dependent clause. Just as if I were an alien coming down to the earth, I'm looking for a human. You know, I don't want, I don't want a girl. I don't want a boy. I want a human. I just want a human to begin with, and then I'll start looking at the boys and girls and men and women and the children and all that. I just want a human. Well, you can't find a human. A human is an idea. It's a generality, but by the time you find a human, already it will have split either into a male or a female, right? Yeah. So it's the same idea. This is a generality. These are the specifics, either independent or dependent, okay? So we've been working with uh, sentences that, that contain one independent clause. They might contain compound elements, subjects, direct objects, even adjectives or adverbs, but they really are still only one independent clause, right? Okay, easy enough to understand. 
But uh, and when we diagram one independent clause, we know what we're doing. There it is. So let's say I went to Papa John's Pizza last night with my family, and uh, you know I ordered pizza. Okay, I ordered pizza. It makes sense to me. I went to a pizza parlor. Period. And uh, my sister ordered salad. My sister ordered salad. Another sentence, another independent clause. Sister ordered salad. My sister. Okay, easy enough, period. But these two sentences are both, they're related because after all they're talking about the same story, so I can put them together into one sentence. And if I did that, I would say, I ordered, uh, last night I went to Papa John's Pizza. I ordered pizza, comma, but my sister ordered salad, period. So I put them together. How did I do it? Well, I did it by joining them with a comma and the coordinating conjunction but. So the truth is that this is now not a simple sentence anymore. When we have just one independent clause, we have a simple sentence a simple sentence because it's just one independent clause. But when we, when we put two independent clauses together, so it's independent clause times two equals a compound sentence. Okay? Independent clause times two equals a compound sentence. There are four kinds of sentences in the world, and now we're, we, will, we will be studying two of them, the diagram of two of them, the simple sentence, and times two, the compound sentence. Could even be times three or four. You can have five independent clauses in one sentence, you would still just have a compound sentence, right? So there are actually two ways to join the two independent clauses. You can use a comma and a coordinating conjunction, or, or a semicolon. That's all that's needed by law, one of these two. It's like getting inspectors to come when you're adding on to your house, and you have to add on a certain way. There are certain ways you could add on room or add on an electrical panel, which I'm in the process of doing, and have to get all these okays uh, and all this. But still, uh, here there are only two ways to add on, either with a comma and a coordinating conjunction, which I call comma CC. It's like CC, comma CC, CCC, or a semicolon. That's all that's necessary is a semicolon. So for example, I could say, I ordered pizza, semicolon. My sister ordered salad. Now what's the role of this conjunction? The point is when we put two of these independent clauses together, there's a relationship established. And this coordinating conjunction expresses the relationship. Semicolon does not express the relationship. It's leaving the relationship up to the reader to feel properly. But for example here, I can make this a laundry list. I can just say, I ordered pizza, comma, and my mom ordered lasagna, comma, and my dad ordered a calzone, comma, and my sister ordered salad. A list. So my relationship is that I'm adding. That's the relationship of addition, and that's certainly a legitimate logic, the logic of addition. But here, for example, I chose but. Now this is a precise choice because but expresses contrast. I ordered pizza, comma, but my sister ordered salad, you know, and it expresses the relationship of contrast because I thought she was crazy for eating salad, going to a pizza parlor and eating salad. How crazy, what a waste, uh, you know. So uh, in our choice of connection between clauses, and this is true forever, when we get into combining all sorts of different types of clauses and sentences, which you do already when you write. You just don't realize what you're doing. It's the relationship that you establish between them on clauses that is of critical importance. It isn't the facts themselves. Facts are cheap. They're everywhere, especially now with the internet. Everyone has access to a million facts. What's the difference in, between you know, the way Charlene writes about a subject with the same facts and as uh, from the way Chris writes about the subject, it's the relationship established between the facts. In every court case, the two lawyers for the two sides, they have the same facts at their disposal. 
What's the difference? Why does one side win? Because of the relationship established between the facts. So the stronger the relationship, the more persuasive the relationship you win the, you win the case. So don't get, don't, don't uh, make facts your false god. It's the relationship. That's where the thinking takes place. That's where your critical thinking lies, you see. So we have to be aware of that. That's a very important little point here. But, so now, mm, just so we know, let's look at these coordinating conjunctions. We've been working with just three, and, but, and, or. Emily, a little bit higher. And, but, and, or. But actually, there are, there are, we have the good old fanboys. Ever heard of fanboys? It's the acronym that helps us remember the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven coordinating conjunctions. What does that stand for? For and nor but or yet so. Each one expresses a different relationship, a different logic. But it's actually sort of complicated, but it's important, not complicated, but it uh, strings on here, coordinating conjunctions. What word do we see co as a prefix? What does co mean? Well, it means together in a sense. There's a unity, but our, is this, when they're together, well, you could be together with Phoebe, but you're not exactly equal, you're taller. So co, if you're co-captains of the football team or volleyball team or basketball team, are you equal? Yeah, you're equal. You're, you're sharing the responsibilities. So if, you have, if you're co-presidents of your class, there was a tie in the election, okay, you're equal. So coordinating conjunctions give order to two or more elements, but these elements are equal. Okay? So that's why they're called coordinating conjunctions, because the relationship is one of equality, even though you're also expressing perhaps a light, uh, a certain amount of cause and effect, or uh, contrast, or exclusion, you know. So, for and or, but for, what does for express? I got an A for I had studied really hard. What's the relationship there? Huh? Because you did. So I'm establishing the relationship of? Cause and effect, exactly. For actually, it's effect and cause. First, I get the effect. I got an A for I had studied very hard. So I'm doing effect and cause, actually. Okay, and is the logic of addition, nor is the logic of subtraction. <laughs> well, hmm? it's a negative, but it's it's a second negative. Neither Chris. Nor, see, nor uh, Charlene did the homework. So, yeah, I'm, I'm adding a second negative in a way. I'm excluding the second time. But shows contrast or shows choice. choice. Very good, right. Chucky chocolate or vanilla? I don't know. Okay, yet. What does yet show? I studied hard. Yet, I miss six out of eight. <laughs> it just came to me when I saw you there. I don't know why. <laughs> so, uh, what is yet showing there? What is that? I studied hard, yet uh, I didn't pass. Huh? Well, but do you have a name for that kind of logic? There is a name for it. Negative effects. Negative effects. Well. No. You know what it is? Um, you are always mean to me, Phoebe. You're my, you're my big sister. You're always, you've been mean to me my whole life. Then you say, well, what about the time that I, you know, I helped you uh, with your algebra homework? Okay. Well, that was that once, but that's the only time. You're always, you've always been mean to me except for that one time. You've always been just so mean to me. So, I'll concede that one point. Okay, that one time you helped me with algebra. I'll concede that. I'll allow you that one exception. There's that one exception, I admit. But other than that, you just always get so mean to me. You just hate me. I'm going to remember. <laughs> See? 
<clears throat> so actually yet shows the logic of concession. You're conceding one thing, but otherwise you have a pattern here. See? So I said you, I, you would expect you study really hard, you get a good grade. I study really hard, yet I got a <coughs> You study really hard to get an A. I did no work to work that. And then what is social? I studied really hard, so I got an A. <clears throat> huh? That's cause and effect. Or is effect and cause. So is cause and effect. So, all right. So has many meanings. It doesn't always mean, mean <clears throat> that relationship.